It's because the world's in the hand of scum like them that it's all screwed to hell. I mean, we're not the nicest of guys, but at least we're honest about it. World nobles, slaves, human shops. Against the purity of these upper classes, the villains of the world look positively humane in comparison. Hello and welcome to One Piece 101, the series that breaks down everyone and everything in the One Piece world. Today, we are going to be ascending into the heavens in order to gaze upon those who sit at the pinnacle of the planet, the world nobles. The world nobles are essentially the ruling class of the One Piece planet due to their association with and in fact direct control over the world government. In fact, the makeup of the modern day world nobility are the direct descendants of 19 of the 20 kings who established the world government roughly 800 years ago. Although to say they retain the qualities of a good ruler or even those of passing nobility would be entirely inaccurate to say the least. Whatever they may have been in the past, the world nobles have become an incredibly disconnected sect of extremist elites who constantly abuse their power and resources in order to fulfill fleeting selfish desires. Furthermore, they look upon anybody with lower status than themselves as less than human, seeing their lives as utterly insignificant, comparable to that of an insect, probably even less to be honest. And a lot of this attitude certainly springs from the general lifestyle of the world nobles who reside atop the red line at the holy land of Marijois. So along with this visual representation of superiority, as well as the claim that they possess the blood of the world's creators, this has led to a class of individuals who are able to completely disregard any laws that apply to greater society. In fact, unless it's a crime committed against another world noble, these guys are allowed to do quite literally anything they want to anyone or anything, from the lowliest of pirates to the most regal of kings of the nations of the world. And to demonstrate the kind of horrors that these folk are capable of, let's go ahead and look at the very first time we were introduced to them in the series during the Sabadi arc. Here we met three charming world nobles named Saint Roswad, Saint Sharia, and the ever infamous Saint Charlos. Which first of all, let's just address the fact that by virtue of simply being a world noble, you are automatically granted the title of saint, further artificially elevating them from the existence of the filthy surface people. And filthy surface people are a legitimate concern of the world nobles, who when descending from the fluffy clouds of Marijuana, elect to don resin bubbles over their heads so as to prevent them from breathing the air of the commoners. They also happen to possess an incredibly disproportionate amount of the world's wealth, as demonstrated during this arc when St. Charles bid a ridiculous 500 million berries at a human auction house for a mermaid. And the reason why he bid on her was simply so that he could plonk her in a tank of piranhas and see how long she'd survive for. So that's 500 million berries there spent on cruel fleeting entertainment. Luckily, this effort was put to an abrupt end by a punch in the face from Monkey D. Luffy. However, this action would go on to highlight the terrifying underlying power of the world nobles, as after the strike, a Marine Admiral was immediately summoned to Sabadi to enact retribution. And just so that we're clear, a Marine Admiral is no joke. There's only three of them at any given time, and along with the Fleet Admiral, they have the job of overseeing the entirety of the Marine organization around the world. So summoning one of them to act on behalf of a particular world noble is a pretty big thing to do, and an action that can assumedly be invoked by any of them. With all of this said, I should also note that not all celestial dragons represent this incredibly ugly persona, and there have been several who show a more down-to-earth nature. The prime example of which being Don Quixote Homing, who decided to leave his comfortable life on Marijuana in order to live a normal existence with humans on the surface world. However, despite his good intentions, relations between regular people and world nobles have never exactly been stellar, and as such, he and his family were tortured, had their house burnt down, and eventually Homing would be murdered by one of his very own sons, Don Quixote Del Flamingo, who would go on to become a warlord of the sea and be forever disowned as a world noble due to the actions of his father. Homing was not the only dragon to have showed some much needed humanity though, and our second example of this is a noble by the name of Saint Mosgard. Now it should be stated that Mosgard started out like your typical world noble, traveling to Fishman Island in order to secure his prized Fishman slave collection, only to be shipwrecked on the island and left at the mercy of its inhabitants. And were it not for the actions of Queen Otohime, Mosgard would have certainly been killed right then and there. However, Otohime would go on to have a profound effect on Mosgard, seemingly accomplishing the impossible and reforming him into, dare I say, a decent human being, which was shown during the Reverie arc when Mosgard decided to stop Charlos from taking Princess Shirahoshi into slavery. But don't get the wrong idea here, most world nobles are still very much the epitome of old money, such as Saint Jalmak, who when visiting the Goa Kingdom on Dawn Island, fired upon a tiny ship containing a small child, simply because it cut in front of his ship and was flying a Jolly Roger. That child happened to be a certain Sabo, by the way, who did survive the attack and became motivated enough to join the Revolutionary Army, an organization that exists for the sole purpose of removing the world nobles from power. So with everything we know about the world nobles so far, you'd be forgiven for wondering exactly how they've retained power for the last 800 years. And a lot of that has to do with their higher ranking members, because that's right, even amongst the world nobles, there are still tiers, with those at the pinnacle being referred to as the Gorosei, or the Five Elder Stars. Quite notably, these five individuals do not display the trademark petulance of their kind, but rather a great intelligence and aptitude for maintaining their own power within the world. 
And here is a short spoiler warning for the events of the Reverie arc. It's been over for a while now in the anime, but I think it's still fresh enough to warrant this. So if you haven't seen it and you really don't want to know what happens, then do skip to this time. I promise I won't be long. But for everyone else, here we go. And of course, I'd also be remiss if I did not mention Eam, the only figure to whom even the Gorosei answer to. And while he at this point has never officially been referred to as a world noble, he at the very least rules over the entirety of them from the shadows and appears to have terrifying decision-making power beyond that of any other singular entity in the One Piece world. Some more fun facts about the World Nobles. If you're an avid part of the One Piece fan community, you may on occasion hear the World Nobles be referred to as the Celestial Dragons. In fact, I think there's quite a few videos where I've even used this term interchangeably. This is because in Japanese, they have been referred to by two different terms, one of which being Tenryubito, which means heavenly or celestial dragons, while the other is Sekai Kikozu, from which we derive the World Noble translation. However, both are correct, and it really doesn't matter which one you say, I've just chosen World Nobles, just because. In order to supplement the lavish lifestyle of the world nobles, each nation associated with the world government is required to pay a heavenly tribute at regular intervals, in many cases completely crippling the economy of certain islands in the process and leaving their citizens on the verge of starvation. Of the 20 kingdoms who fall in the world government, only one refused to relocate its royalty to the Holy Land of Marichois, being the Nefertari family of Alabaster, which is a relief when you think about the fact that if they'd chosen to make the move, well, we could have ended up with a very different Saint Vivi. And finally, a truly useless fact, even the world nobles are not immune to the wonders of owning dogs. And they will even go on to dress them in adorable little bubble helmets as well, watching on proudly as they proceed to pee on the masses. But that pretty much does it for the world nobles. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produced in general, then please do consider donating to the Grand Line Review Patreon because the support of all of your amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. And if you'd like to see more videos like this but apply to other anime and manga series, then please do check out my second channel, New World Review, for all of your wider needs. And if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server where a wide array of shenaniganry takes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with who, what, or where you'd like to see featured in the next One Piece 101.